I love my beauty routine, and while I will always acknowledge Ancient Egypt for their discoveries in eyeliner, I'm a little more than weary when it comes to some of the older beauty traditions and history. And as a modern Western woman, I'm also very much influenced by what the society I was raised in taught me was beautiful. So some other traditions might seem scary to me, and I thought it would be best if we chatted about all of that together. Now, I've talked about blacked teeth before, but have you ever heard about aesthetic smiles? So the beauty fad of teeth whitening using sulfuric acid began in the Georgian era and became very common in Britain. This technique used a powder made from cuttlefish and bicarbonate of soda. The acid wash was done regularly and ended up quickly stripping people's teeth of enamel, further leading to tooth decay. Okay, mark that off the list of at-home remedies to try for whiter teeth. I love a good cleansing face mask from time to time to clean out the pores, but the ancient Romans, who loved their luxury and indulgence, took that to a whole other level. One of their most bizarre and unusual beauty trends was the phenomenon of using gladiator sweat for facials. These facials were believed to improve complexion and maintain youthfulness, since the sweat of successful gladiators was considered a potent aphrodisiac. In ancient Rome, most gladiators were revered by society for their physical prowess and fighting skills. They often fought to death in front of cheering crowds in the Colosseum. The more successful a gladiator was in the arena, the more potent their bodily fluids were believed to be. Apparently, their success could literally rub off on you. Or so the Romans believed. Now, we're not quite sure how or when this trend got started, but hey, quickly enough, wealthy Roman women were paying big bucks and seeking out the sweat of these gladiators. The sweat was collected from their bodies using a tool called a strigil. This was used for scraping off the dirt, the sweat, and oil across both ancient Greek and Roman cultures. It would then occasionally be mixed with olive oil to give it a better, more desirable consistency. And then people sold it as a facial cream to the wealthy women who wanted to pay big bucks. The facial of gladiator sweat was just one of many any beauty trends that made use of those gladiator bodily fluids, by the way. Their redness, that uh, elixir of life, was supposedly another popular commodity, again, sold as an aphrodisiac. Some historians even report that the redness of wounded or killed gladiators would be mixed with wine and consumed by many. Despite being a common practice in ancient Rome, the trend of using gladiator sweat and redness in beauty products might seem barbaric and gross by today's standards. However, it is a fascinating example of the lengths that people will go to in the pursuit of beauty and youthfulness. Oh, Pardon me, I'm just debating if WWE superstars would be the equivalent in today's day and age. And I was wondering how one would go about collecting Cody Rhodes' sweat. Or Rhea Ripley's. I'm not picky. At several points in history, having healthy looking rosy cheeks was all the rage among fashionable women. Even today, the slightly flushed look is found highly appealing, but today's rouges all contain safe, highly tested ingredients. I swear, I'm actually wearing blush. But unless I'm cosplaying a Disney princess, I prefer a more natural look. But in the past, women hoping to achieve a natural looking blush turned to a host of different substances in an attempt to get just the right shade. And one of the most popular ingredients was cinnabar. What was this? It was a volcanic mineral ore from from which mercury can be derived, and it has a vibrant red color that seemed to be ideal for addition to cosmetics and powders. When ground up and added to other ingredients, it could easily be applied onto the cheeks as a form of rouge. Unfortunately, as we now know, mercury is extremely toxic and can result in damage to the muscular and nervous system. Needless to say, cinnabar is no longer allowed to be used in any form of cosmetic product. That would be a small comfort, I guess, to the generations of women who suffered an early death due to mercury poisoning. All right. Who out here has worn a wig in their lifetime? I'm sure plenty of us have, and I have the gallon of spirit gum in my apartment to prove it. It took history a moment, though, to get to the point of using that substance. Since the early 17th century, the trend of using lard as a base for extreme hairstyles showed no sign of dying. This technique was used in Europe and North America and was passed down from generation to generation. The concept behind this practice was that lard could repair hair loss, thinning hair, split ends, dryness, and roughness of the scalp. It would also apparently add volume to thinner, fine hair and make sure that they're elaborate wigs. Think like Marie Antoinette. Those stayed in place. It's been said that because rats were attracted to the hair product, they would often make homes in them. Eh. Also, they were highly combustible and often resulted in scalp scars and lice. So glad we've moved away from that practice as a society. Foot binding might be one of the most outlandish beauty trends in history and arguably the most painful. If you're about to comment saying corsets were worse, please take several seats and do some research, since those were only harmful if worn in unsafe ways and will not be on today's list. For centuries, Chinese women had their feet bound from an early age. The goal was to achieve a dainty three-inch golden lotus. This practice completely altered the shape of the foot. Now, I'm not quite sure when it began, but some of the earliest evidence for this comes from the tomb of Lady Huang Shang, who died in 1243, so it happened for a while. Archaeologists found lotus shoes embroidered with elegant designs that were only three inches long. They were often made for women by their husbands or lovers. The shoes, as well as the miniaturized feet, were highly prized. Even the wealthiest, most powerful woman had to work to maintain them. But, like I said before, 
before. This was incredibly painful and highly dangerous. How do you do it? Well, let me tell you, and then you'll see. So to start, you're going to plunge your feet into hot water and all of your toes, except for your big one, are going to be broken and bound flat against the sole. So you're going to strain the arch of the foot because your foot is completely... <laughs> Finally, you're going to bind your feet into place using a long silk strip. Now you remove and change it every two days to prevent infection, but infection's still going to get through. Also, if you weren't like a lofty royal lady, you're going to have to walk long distances while your feet are bound. So over time, the wrappings get tighter. You squeeze the heel and the sole closer together and... <laughs> Apparently the process took about two years when all was said and done, which that's a long freaking time. The impact of foot binding was fairly significant throughout China. It likely arose out of social forces that subjugated women, and it was pretty common. I find it offers a shocking example of how women's fashion and traditional beauty practices can be really be destructive and harmful. And despite being banned in 1911, it still survives in some remote parts of China. Look, I understand keeping tradition alive, and I hope those who practice this achieve what they need out of it. Just in my modern Canadian opinion, it's a little barbaric. As we've seen today, the pursuit of beauty can come in many forms. And like foot binding, some of the other practices can also lead to irreversible consequences. Another prime example of this, the Mayan practice of skull elongation. So the Mayan civilization thrived around 300 to 900 AD and was located in parts of what is now Mexico and Central America. Artificial cranial deformation was a common practice amongst those people. They believed that this beauty technique would bring them closer to the gods and signify nobility. They would use a special head flattening apparatus to intentionally shape the skull of some young humans during the first few years of life. The process would involve a constant pressure exerted on a little one's developing skull. And what would happen? Well, you'd get an elongated conical shape to the head made for a stupefying physical appearance. The Mayans believed that the techniques would keep their young one's souls and physical existence in balance. It was also believed that doing this could prevent evil winds. The elongated skull was also considered to confer nobility and other social status symbols and a sense of beauty. Today, there are other forms of artificial official cranial deformation still in practice for hierarchical and religious purposes. As bizarre and unique as this beauty trend might be, it raises a lot of questions for me at least, just about the impact they can have. Like it produced a lot of differences in aesthetic features, skull shape, but there's really no evidence indicating that it led to increased cranial size or brain growth. Also, some studies suggest that this distortion negatively impacts some lobes of the brain. Ultimately, the Maya people upheld this beauty trend for centuries. To each their own, I guess. Having beautiful dewy eyes has always been a sign of a beautiful woman, but never more so than in Renaissance Italy. Fashionable Italian women followed a punishing cosmetic routine of using belladonna eye drops so that their pupils would dilate and create a wide-eyed, strikingly seductive look. While belladonna means beautiful lady in translation, it's also another name for the deadly nightshade plant, a well-known poison. Although these eye drops certainly created a dewy-eyed appearance, they also caused a lot of unpleasant side effects. I'm talking blurred vision, headaches, hallucinations, vomiting, vertigo, blindness. These things were very dangerous. It might surprise you to learn that atropine, the ingredient in belladonna that causes the pupil dilation, they still use it today. But it's only for eye examinations under medical supervision. Yeah, I'll stick to my regular animated Bambi eyes, thanks. I don't need Pixar levels of animation. I think that's wide enough. Fashions and eyebrow style have varied considerably over the years, from the barely there look of the medieval period to the heavy dark brows of the 1950s. Kind of like how Elizabeth Taylor had. Eyebrows were also sometimes used as an emotional statement, such as in ancient Egypt, where cat owners would shave them off when their beloved pet died. However, one of the strangest trends, in my opinion, was the ancient Greek preference for the unibrow and the lengths they went to to achieve this look. Greek women believed that untouched natural eyebrows showed purity, and the unibrow was the ultimate statement of beauty and intelligence. Those who were cursed with lighter patchy brows filled them in using coal, or more drastically, here's the kicker folks, false eyebrows made out of goat skin and stuck to their face using tree resin. While the goat skin trend died out pretty rapidly, an even more revolting look for eyebrows might have emerged in the 18th century. Fashionable women during this era often chose to pluck out their eyebrows completely, and according to several writers of the day, replace them with fake ones made from mouse skin. I'll pass. Here's a beauty standard that's not bad by any means, but scary by Western beauty standards. For the Mercy tribe, large colorful lip plates are a symbol of great beauty. This interesting accessory is more frequently worn by newlywed and unmarried women than by older women who have given birth. They are usually worn on specific occasions and for important rituals like weddings. Scary to look at, but not harmful, so to each their own. And we're gonna end today 
plague with a mainstream one, redness letting. It was typically thought to restore balance and remove excess. One of the fathers of medicine, Hippocrates, believed that diseases were caused by an imbalance in the four basic humors. And treatment consisted of getting rid of excess by various means, such as this one. So ancient Egyptians, Greeks, Romans, Asians, and more, they all practiced it, going back at least 3,000 years. Like in the Renaissance era, it was very prevalent across Europe. The technique remained in use as a medicinal treatment until the late 19th century when it was finally discredited. Now this could be done through multiple means, but leeches were the go-to. The medicinal leech could ingest almost 10 times its weight in human fluids. This practice was believed to cure a wide range of diseases, and was used for everything from pneumonia and seizures to mental illness and female hysteria. Now you might be asking, okay Alexa, but where's the beauty here? Well, aside from healing an ailing patient, it was a beauty trend in its own right throughout history. In many different cultures and societies, like Elizabethan England, the look of a pale complexion was all the rage. Makeup was the most common route to achieving this, but getting rid of extra fluids wasn't uncommon. Undergoing this procedure could reliably leave patients with a pale face, and a lot of women were like, I like it. Although this way of doing things has been discredited for most illnesses, leech therapy is actually still used today, less often for fashion and beauty. But, eh. I've never been so happy to be naturally pale. And that's it for me once again. I've been Alexa, your resident emo girly. See y'all next time I buzz in over here at Bumblebee. Ooh.